Hi there. My name's Chris Lewin, and I'm going to talk about Swish. Swish is a machine learning based cloth simulation that was used to represent the player jerseys in the next gen console version of Madden NFL 21. Swish is a collaboration between my group, Seed, which is a research group at Electronic Arts, and Tiburon, which is the studio that makes Madden. Madden is a simulation sports game, which means that it tries to represent the sport of American football as accurately as possible. One of the most important parts of this is representing the characters in the game, who are real people whose appearances players will be very familiar with. One of the aspects we would like to represent faithfully is the motion of the clothing the players wear. The flowing and deforming wrinkles of the NFL jerseys really help to sell the power and athleticism of these sportsmen, so we would like to include that in the game. However, in previous generations, Madden has not done a great job of this. On the left here, you can see the model used on previous gen consoles. This consists of just a skinned jersey mesh and a couple of normal maps that are blended depending on whether the character is twisting left or right. There is an obvious crossfading problem that occurs when blending two very different normal maps like this. The wrinkles implied by the normal maps also fail to make any difference to the silhouette, which is completely smooth. On the right, you can see our new Swish model. This model smoothly interpolates both mesh deformations and normal maps, breaking up the silhouette and hoping, helping to sell the motion of the character. So let's jump right into the details of how we did this. This work began when I saw Dan Holden's excellent SCA19 paper where he trained a neural network to predict the dynamic motions of various elastic objects. This was the first paper to efficiently handle collision in a reduced coordinate simulation. And for the first time, it felt like reduced simulations might be practical for use in a real game. However, there are quite a few steps to go through from this to a system usable in a real game. In particular, the resolution of the object is quite low compared to what modern gamers are used to. For Swish, we adopted a lot of the same practices as this, as this paper, but reined in our ambitions a bit in order to create something that could ship in a game. One of the main problems with Holden 19 is the fact that it has to predict dynamics. This requires a huge amount of training data and raises the possibility of numerical explosions and other feedback issues. However, football jerseys are quite tight. Tight clothing should exhibit fewer dynamics, so we thought that it was worth investigating a quasi-static cloth system. By removing the dynamics, we significantly simplify the problem. Our system takes in the rotations of a few selected joints and passes them to a neural network, which tells us what the cloth shape should be given that pose. In the shipped models, we used only the four joints of the character's spine to predict the cloth motion. We also mask out any forward and backward bending motion in order to further reduce the space that has to be considered. We only predict wrinkles on the bottom half of the player's jersey because the top half is very tightly constrained. All of these restrictions combined brought our pre-processing times down to about six hours per asset by the end of the project with most of this time being spent running cloth simulations in Marvelous Designer. Lifting these restrictions and allowing for a more expressive cloth model is important future work for us, but the speed of our pre-processing pipeline will have to be significantly improved for this to be feasible. So how do we do static cloth simulations? We can't just increase the damping factor in the simulation to get the cloth to behave statically. A lot of cloth motion is determined by frictional effects, which means that even when heavily damped, the pose of the cloth depends not just on the current pose of the character, but the path the character took to get there. To remove this path dependence, we use a simple technique. We record from the game all the poses the character can get into, sample them with some predefined density, and then for each of these target poses, we run a separate cloth simulation during which the character deforms from the neutral pose to this target pose. This ensures that the state of the clothing is explainable purely as a function of the target pose. Simulating all these separate simulations is the main pre-processing cost of Swish. To achieve the look we ended up shipping with, we used about 700 simulations for each cloth asset. There are potentially better ways of exploring the space of static cloth behavior, such as by restarting the cloth simulation from previously recorded poses. However, we don't have enough control over the simulation to do this because we used a closed source commercial solver. 
Instead, we just take advantage of the independence of each simulation and run them all in parallel. The high quality source simulations contain many thousands of triangles, which is too much detail for an in-game mesh. In games, we typically use low resolution meshes and suggest the appearance of detail using normal maps. To enable this for Swish, we create a lower resolution in-game mesh that is constrained to follow corresponding positions on the high resolution source mesh. Then we calculate tangent space normal maps that represent the difference between these meshes. In this project, we were retrofitting an already existing asset, the player jersey, which has a large amount of content restrictions, like needing to have a certain UV mapping and match the other parts of the character at the seams. So in this case, the in-game mesh had a completely different topology to the source simulation mesh. This meant we had to generate the normal maps using ray casting from one mesh to the other, which is not quite as reliable as using a UV map to create the same correspondence. We also added a number of post-processing operations to the in-game mesh, implemented as a deformer stack in Maya. This included adding smoothing to reduce the appearance of jagged triangles, and blending back to the skinned mesh towards the seams. Characters in Madden use a separate blend shape system to allow characters to have different silhouettes. This is used to represent different physiques, as well as the presence of armour, like the flak jackets worn by quarterbacks. We deal with the different armor types by training different Swish assets corresponding to each armor type. And we train physiques, we handle physiques by specifically training special assets for characters with heavy body types. For all the other body types, we simply apply Swish vertex offsets on top of the blend shapes. This works well as long as the motion of the Swish source simulations is similar enough to the original skin jersey asset. These difficulties related to retrofitting a complex existing asset caused a lot of headaches during production, and we would not have had to deal with them if we were creating a new asset from scratch. So how do we actually represent cloth, cloth, cloth motions in the game? Having a neural network directly output vertex positions is possible, but expensive and harder to train. Instead, we decompose the cloth motions using Principal Component Analysis, or PCA. The neural network only knows about the PCA weights, and then we can use those weights to reconstruct the cloth motion on the GPU before the character is rendered. We also represent the mesh deformations as a difference from the skinned mesh position, which makes them generally much smaller and means the PCA basis does not have to contain as much information. We tried representing our normal maps in the same way as meshes using PCA. However, this gave very poor results. The number of PCA textures we had to add together to get a good reconstruction was extremely high, and the results with this technique never matched the source data. Instead, we ended up using a nearest neighbor database of normal maps. The neural network still predicts a set of PCA weights for the textures. But instead of trying to reconstruct the textures directly from this representation, we go and look up the nearest entry in a nearest neighbor database. This is a texture array containing 128 entries in our shipped models, each of which is an original source normal map. The database key is the PCA weight representation of this source normal map, and the lookup consists of just finding the nearest database key to the PCA weights the neural network has produced. In a sense, this is a kind of flipbook approach for animating normal maps, although it's a random access database rather than a linear progression of textures. With this method, the static appearance of the normal app always exactly matches one of the source textures. This makes screenshots look good, but in motion there is an obvious pop when switching from one normal map to another. To deal with this, we use a simple temporal filter, where the new selection is blended into the last few frames results. This masks the pop well enough that it is not visible in normal gameplay, only becoming noticeable if the characters animate very slowly from pose to pose, such as in instant replay. So here is the entire Swish process from beginning to end. First, in the data pipeline, we generate these learning animations, each of which is a 30 frame transition from the neutral to a target pose. For each learning animation, we do a separate cloth offline cloth simulation using Marvelous Designer, ending at the target pose, and then capture a normal map and mesh shape from the final frame. These are then associated with the bone rotations of the target pose, and after PCA compression, become a single data point used for neural network training. 
Details about the neural network architecture and training can be found in the accompanying abstract. At runtime, new poses of the skeleton are presented to the network, which gives us a new set of combined PCA weights representing the network's choice for the mesh deformation and normal map. The weights corresponding to the mesh are combined with the matching PCA vectors and used to deform the mesh, and the normal map weights are used to look up into the nearest neighbor database. We can then just use the deformed mesh and selected normal map to render the character as normal. While this method does work, the lack of dynamics can lead to a rather boring look in some cases. The problem is that we are relying on the character's skeleton motion to drive the changes in the wrinkles, but the characters mostly don't get into very dramatic poses when they're doing basic actions like running around. We had trained a system that looked good in the extremes, but bad in the average case. The way we worked around this was by just multiplying the inputs by a fixed factor that we called the drama factor. Combined with a clamp to prevent the inputs from going outside the range seen in training, this allowed us to make sure the basic case of walking around had some interesting motion to it. Now, I mentioned before that we have normal map databases of 128 textures each. With five separate assets corresponding to different body and clothing types, we could have potentially spent a lot of memory storing normal maps that looked very similar to one another. Even after doing basic compression, like packing the relevant UV islands together in a reduced space, we were using 80 megabytes of texture memory. Our database has to be random access, so we can't use any kind of video compression to decrease the size of these databases. Instead, we used a simple vector quantization approach applied to 4x4 blocks. Each texture in the normal map becomes a 16-bit index into an atlas texture, which is compressed with BC5. Compared to using BC5 alone, this was about a five times memory saving. This was a big memory win, and the quality difference was not noticeable in the content we ended up shipping. Okay, now let's have a look at our results. This video shows a few different cinematic shots from the game. Swish is turned on all the time during gameplay and cinematics, although the mesh deformations are only applied to the highest LOD, which is never seen during 60 FPS direct gameplay. You can see here that the dynamic detail provided by Swish helps to sell the movement of the characters and also lends a subtle realism to their motion. In particular, the impression of armor shifting under the clothing of certain characters is almost impossible to replicate with a real-time cloth solver without very expensive self-collision. Compared with traditional procedural techniques like normal map blending, Swish has much greater fluidity of motion and compared with standard real-time cloth simulations, it has much higher apparent resolution due to the ability to produce normal maps. Here's a comparison between the different aspects of the Swish feature and how they both contribute. On the left, you can see the combined effect of mesh deformations and normal maps. In the middle, you can see the mesh deformations only and on the right, normal maps only. The combination of low-res mesh deformations and animated normal maps is definitely more than the sum of its parts. When we take away either part of the puzzle, the illusion breaks down completely. One limitation the middle picture does make clear is that by deforming a low-resolution mesh, we can create problems with harsh shading and shadows. We do apply a low-pass filter to the mesh deformations to try to control this, but it's hard to solve it completely with a low polygon budget. In the future, we want to look at increasing mesh resolution and maybe even using dynamic meshing to overcome this problem. Now let's have a look at some performance information. Swish is implemented in EA's game engine, Frostbite. The neural network runs on the CPU in a simple custom inference engine, created mainly with the intention of supporting load and go style resource management. It's not particularly optimized for speed, but the extreme simplicity of our neural network architecture means network performance is not an issue at all for Swish. The main costs on CPU and GPU are related to mesh deformations using Frostbite's mesh compute system, which also includes skinning and recalculating vertex normals. The more major costs of our model are the memory requirements. Although our neural network is small enough to be negligible, the need for us to store a texture database per asset means we have some fairly high fixed costs for each different cloth type. In Madden, there are only five assets for the whole game, so after our normal map compression optimizations, the cost is fairly reasonable. Because we perform a temporal blend for the normal maps per instance, we need a unique texture per instance that is also not able to be compressed. This is the main memory cost in the shipped version, although there is a lot that could easily be done to get that cost down. <laughs> 
In general, we came into this project assuming that we would end up with a very expensive runtime system that would have to be carefully throttled, and we were surprised that we ended up completely overshooting our performance targets. The only problems with performance were related to pre-processing times, which were up to 48 hours per asset at one point in the project. Before we end, I just have a few more thoughts to share. This was my first machine learning project, and I found my assumptions about the problems about what the problems would be were constantly proven wrong. Neural network performance was not an issue as long as we kept away from models that were obviously going to be algorithmically slow, like trying to predict individual vertices or pixels. Preprocessing time ended up being much more important than runtime performance, as well as the large numbers of offline simulations requiring a lot of disk space. In order to get these preprocessing times down, we ended up making last minute cuts to the scope of the simulation removing the arm and shoulder joints, as well as forward-backward bending motion of the spine. This was critical to allow us to iterate on the look of the cloth and meet the challenging art direction requirements for an asset that's often right in front of the player's eyes. I'm still not entirely happy with our flipbook approach to generating image data with a neural network, and I feel like there must be some more efficient way of doing this. It's possible that doing this fundamental research or taking the performance hit of using convolutional neural networks will be necessary to scale Swish to more complex garments and input characters. And the other obvious limitation of Swish is the fact that it's a quasi-static model, whereas real cloth is notorious for bouncing and flapping around. Even football jerseys are actually much more dynamic than our idealized model. There are a couple of different possibilities for supporting dynamics. One way is to train a dynamic autoregressor where the Swish neural network would be consuming its previous output each frame. This could potentially allow for high quality simulations, but requires much more training data and is not as controllable as a static deformer system. Another option is to recast Swish as an upsampling process, which would be applied to a more traditional real-time cloth simulation. This has its own set of problems, in particular related to the generation of training pairs. High quality offline simulations will typically make completely different shapes to low resolution real time simulations of the same garment. So finding some way to constrain these simulations to one another is key. It's not clear whether it's possible to do this without losing a lot of the aspects that we like about offline simulations, like being able to tightly hug the contours of the body. Either way, supporting dynamics is our next main goal for this project and I hope to be able to show you some beautiful dynamic cloth simulated with Swish in an EA game soon. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Uh, I hope you got something useful from this talk that you can bring back to your own projects. If you want to keep up with developments on Swish, you can follow some of these Twitters. Um, thank you again, and goodbye.